Hi everyone, this is another vinyl update. Uh, it's been two months since I last did one, so I've managed to accumulate quite a bit of uh, vinyl in that time. I've also managed to upgrade my uh, turntable to a manual uh, turntable. I've sort of got tired of having to um, sort of spend ages trying to queue up a 10 inch record and I've got a few so I thought sod it I'll go back to a manual one and it's been pretty great so far I do actually prefer it to my old sort of linear tracker so without further ado this is the first record I'm going to show Elastic Days by Jay Maskis um, of Dinosaur Junior fame and Several Shades of Y um, the these two albums, I've not listened to them a lot, and I think I should try and get around to listening to them. I'm a big Dinosaur Jr. fan, and well, Several Shades of Wise on black vinyl, I uh, did manage to get the sort of loser edition of um, Elastic Days. Um, yeah, I mean, I've seen Jay Maskis play live a couple of years back. He was absolutely brilliant. You know, very, he's a very underrated guitarist, and uh, both these pressings actually are very quiet. You know, very very quiet. I don't know where Sub Pop get their records pressed these days, but wherever it is, they're doing a good job. Um, right, I have some more Jeffro Tom. Um, I managed to get this was my find of the year, um, a very very first pressing of Benefit which is their third album and I know some people write it off as a dry run for Aqualung but I've always thought this record was better than Aqualung and this is the first pressing on Island it's not a pink rim, it's the Green Chrysalis label with the distributed by Island on it so this definitely is a first pressing and it sounds absolutely brilliant there is very little in the way of cracks and pops so it sounds really clean it's not mint but it plays like it's mint and I got Too Old To Rock and Roll Too Young To Die this is a bit of a middling album in there um, during their purple patch um, it's not a bad album actually and it's quite underrated it's not a terrible album as some may suggest it's just very low key um, my, co my copy is currently on the turntable because it's sort of drying off. I did the wood glue treatment on it. Um, you know, I don't usually put wood glue on records to clean them. But this one just sounded like a 78, a patty beat up 78. But I didn't look it, so fingers crossed this might sound pretty good after um, the wood glue is dried. Uh, um, can only help. I didn't. It wasn't a cheap record either. It's about fifteen pounds, which um, yeah, it's a bit of a gamble. Okay, what next? So yeah, still buying a lot of uh, Roy Orbison records. Um, I added three more to my collection. Uh, to my vinyl collection. I also bought this uh, box set. Uh, the MGM years. This is really, really great. Um, if you're a fan of the sort of monument era records, this is really sort of underrated in comparison to that. Um, we well, have some great albums on there. Um, some, of, some of which I'll show off because um, I bought some of them on vinyl. Um, but it's especially worth it because there's one track on one of the albums, The Fastest Guitar Alive, which was a soundtrack to a pretty rotten film that um, Roy Orbison was in. Um, there's a track on there called There Won't Be Many Coming Home, which years later um, Quentin Tarantino put in one of his movies. So um, first off I've got this one, which wasn't part of the box set, but it was, it was released around the same time. This is one of the, one of the lonely ones. Uh, this is, this was unreleased for 45 years, I think. It was recorded in the late 60s and was released around 
2014, 20, 2015, so about 46 years in the vault, which is a, a shame really, because some of the tracks, I mean, he, do, he does a version of Sweet Memories, the, the Mickey Newbury song, and he does it better than Mickey Newbury does. Um, and there's other songs like Defector, which is about the Vietnam War, which is quite a very different kind of song to what Roy Orbison usually does. It's a um, really excellent record. Uh, the Don Gibson one, which is basically uh, an album of basically an album of cover versions of Don Gibson songs. Um, um, what surprised me was, you know, I did actually listen to some Don Gibson and some of his stuff actually does, even though he's a country singer, it, some of it does edge towards rockabilly, which is quite interesting. Um, and finally, uh, last but not least, Cry Softly Lonely One. This album has some great tracks on it, some very underrated ones. Uh, my favourite track on here is It Takes One and No One, where there's sort of a... It almost feels like a Northern Soul track. It has that same vibe. Um, oh, what are the ones? Communication Breakdown, which allegedly Jimmy Page stole the title for a, a Led Zeppelin song. Uh, what else have we got? So moving on to someone else. Eugene McDaniels. Um, or the Left Reverend MCD. Um, Headless Heroes of the Apocalypse. Um, this is this is quite a controversial album back in the day when it was released in the early seventies. Apparently, um, Spyro Agnew, the voice, then vice president, actually phoned up Atlantic Records and told them to um, delete this album instantly, which Atlantic Records did. Um, I mean, I've talked about Eugene McDaniels, or Gene McDaniels as he was once called, um, in the previous video I showed Outlaw, uh, which was the, the preceding album um, to this. And yeah, he's a very underrated figure. He did, he wrote a song compared to what, which is um, probably one of the best sort of Vietnam era protest songs ever written. He wrote. He wrote a lot of songs for Roberta Flack, um, Feel Like Making Love, I think was one of his, the big hits he wrote. Um, but yeah, this is really great stuff, you know, he, he was a really great singer, you know, uh, had a really sort of silky smooth sort of voice, you know, but he's singing these really dark, um, very left-wing political songs. It's really great. Um, and I finally, finally sort of have acquired all the Opus Studio albums on vinyl. I've got the last two I needed, which is uh, My Arms, Your Hearse, which is, um, this is a black on black reissue. And uh, there's this one, which is um, the one on Spine Farm Records, which was, which came out around 2016. I mean, these records are going out of print, so I sort of scrambled to find copies where I could. Um, and for Christmas, I managed to get um, uh, this one. Uh, was it Going of the Going of the Titans, live at Red Rocks Amphitheatre? Um, this one, you know, surprised me. I mean, I don't really go nutty over their newest albums the last three i mean they're not bad albums but um i always like some of the tracks on there with well they do some of the tracks from their last album sorceress i think yeah sorceress so i can't remember <laughs> mine's gone blank but from their last album and they do sound a lot more edgier than um, the studio versions, which is cool. Um, it's a bit crunchier. That's what we'd use. Um, so, yeah, I don't usually buy the sort of, do the sort of having multiple copies of a record in the same format. I try and I have a finite amount of space here. 
so I don't go OTT, but there's a couple of albums that are really special to me, which I really, really enjoy, uh, which I can't be without. Yeah, and one of them is We're Only In It For The Money by um, The Mothers Of Invention. This is a great album, and um, it's crazy that a lot of the sort of stuff that was made in the late 60s, the, the political situation they're describing, there are quite some parallels with the way the world is 50 years later. I mean, this came from a very weird place. It was sort of satirising the sort of hippie counterculture, where um, I think Frank Zappa thought of them as being rather stupid and naive. And, um, yeah, I wouldn't say the whole sort of hippie county counterculture was full of stupid and naive people, but, um, well, it wasn't completely full of stupid and naive people. Um, but at the same time, he did have a point. There are still people who were, who were privileged. It's other people like on, um, he's satirising on take your clothes off when you dance. Um, the sort of very privileged people who think they're, um, uh, what's the word? They think they understand the poor. They think they understand the um, disadvantage in society when they don't really. <laughs> they, they they exist in their own bubble. Um, but yeah, it's a great album. Um, even if I don't really <laughs> agree hundred percent with them. Uh, Frank Zappa's political views, he was right on a lot of things. Um, right, next up, Dr. John and the Night Tripper. Well, not and the Night Tripper, sorry. Dr. John the Night Tripper. Um, is he's, is he's, um, credited as here, but usually goes under the name Dr. John. Um, yeah. This is a classic sort of psychedelic blues album, but I think calling it a psychedelic blues album really does it a disservice. N nothing sounds like this. Um, or it, some people have tried to sort of copy this sound. It's a voodoo themed sort of um, record, psychedelic record. Um, I've always loved this, you know, since I first heard it in my early 20s. It sounds sort of weird, exotic, and a bit creepy at times. Um, but yeah, it, it's. I think for Dr. John himself, it was a really personal record. It's sort of. Um, because growing up, he was sort of around all that voodoo stuff. Uh, I think he grew up on a mixture of voodoo and Catholicism. Um, Excellent record, I think. I bought this one again because it's actually up in mono, just like with the um, picture disc. Um, we're only in it for the money. Um, and this one is on sort of green vinyl. Yeah. Not the nicest of colours, but I'm just so happy to have it on, in mono. Um, there isn't a hell of a lot of difference, it isn't like um, some mono albums I've had, like the Taurus Bird Brothers, where it does sound a hell of a lot different, or you can you can hear a lot in the mix, which uh, stands out from the stereo mix. But um, no, I'm happy to have it. Is it in finding originals of the album is um, originals on mono is very very hard. I'm not even sure if it came out in the UK. And yeah again I've only ever seen sort of reissues of that in the world like early 90s reissues. Um, so another album I really enjoy um, Let There Be Rock by ACDC. One thing if you're buying this album on vinyl do not buy a new reissue because when they were sort of reissuing their albums in the early early noughties, they decided to go with uh, American versions rather than than the sort of uh, European versions or the original Australian versions. 
So in going with the American versions, you had Problem Child on two albums, you know, you had it on this one, you had it on the other one, Dirty Deeds Done Dirt Cheap. Um, this one is actually from the 80s, but any sort of European pressing of this has the original Australian track listing, and um, that's one to get. Um, but this is an excellent album, um, probably the best Bon Scott era one. Arguably, is it either for me? It's always been a toss up between this or Power Age. Um, but it's got a whole lot of Rosie on, which is probably one of my favourite um, ACDC songs. Um, but also Let There Be Rock, which almost sounds like um, punk rock. Um, I always like that one. I know that sort of Henry Rollins actually covered that song. Um, a poor little girl. So it gives them a bit of um, punk rock cred, even though they try to avoid it. Um, right, last but not, not least, I have come pretty damn close, that close to finishing off my um, uh, Leonard Cohen collection. You know, I have, all these records are in print, and which is cool. It's made it a lot easier to sort of fill in the gaps um but currently i've been sort of buying up the rest of the live albums i have all the studio albums and first off is probably one of the best of the bunch i really really enjoyed this record this is uh field commander cohen tour of 1979 and this was recorded sort of in between i think it was after he did recent songs but it it puts him somewhere in between sort of his earlier folk um, era music and his later sort of loungy sort of synth music. You can hear the sort of synth, synth uh, sounds come into play. Um, and it's very good. It, it sounds a lot fuller than a lot of his albums. Plus, you get the novelty of having... Um, sort of uh, on backing vocals is Jennifer Warrens and Sharon Robinson who were actually sort of two of Len Leonard Cohen's closest collaborators yeah which is cool um it's, it's a really worth checking out in the version on there you know I've always been a big fan of um Death of the Ladies Man uh so the version of Memories actually is really impressive you know really really love that track um probably one of my favorite Leonard Cohen songs if not my favorite um what next yeah songs from the road I mean um yeah unfortunately this one arrived with a slight seam split which ended up having a repair um yeah it seems to happen quite a lot but anyway, um, yeah, this is a sort of a compilation of tracks that he sort of recorded uh, live. Or it's a sort of compilation of live recordings from his 2008-2009 tours. Um, yeah, it is what it is. It's, it's not a bad live album. Um, although I kind of like preferred some of the earlier ones. Um, and last but not least, um, is one that I haven't, haven't even opened yet. Um, this is Leonard Cohen Live Songs, which was his first live album from the early 70s. Um, yeah, uh, I haven't heard this one properly, but um, I hope we get around to listen to it. Um, so yeah. That's it for this month. Um, I hope um, everyone had a great Christmas and um, they're having a happy new year. Um, so until next time, goodbye.